Hey, 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 uh, welcome to Real Estate Wisdom Podcast. And uh, I'm your host, uh, Vishal Kapoor, a realtor with Century 21 uh, Miller. And I'm here with the another episode of Real Estate Wisdom Podcast uh, with a uh, state lawyer, um, Shruti Raman. Uh, Shruti has a vast experience of uh, doing with uh, state and um, wills and also these days taking a lot of probate cases. And when I was talking to her and I thought like, you know, why not we do the podcast, uh, giving them information to uh, our people, what probate is, what is the process and what are do's and don'ts. <music> Please uh, help me welcome uh, Shruti Raman. Hey Shruti, how are you? I'm well, Vishal. Thanks for having me back again. It's so good to be here chatting with you on estate matters, which is my favorite thing to do. Absolutely. You're doing that day in and day out. I do. I've been doing this for over a decade now, and I've seen a lot of changes come in mm -hmm. over the years, and things continue to evolve. Oh, for sure. Like, you know, it's... Uh, it's ever changing world of uh, absolutely uh, laws are changing, uh, people's situations are changing, uh, things what used to happen before they're not happening now. Uh, even few new things are happening, so That's it's always right. a change. Change is the only constant. Exactly, exactly. I was going to say that uh, change is the only constant, but uh, you know we adapt change, and uh, but during the change we need like a professional advice. Um, a lot of time, like we try to figure it out our own, uh, and that's where we get into trouble or we incur some losses, right? That's true. Yeah. There is no substitute for professional advice, and it's a great thing for people to at least try to do things on their own. There is uh, a lot of credit to be given for that, mm -hmm. but it's not humanly possible for one individual or a small group of individuals to accomplish everything in something so vast as an estate administration. Yes. So the value of professional advice, whether it's um, accounting and tax advice or legal advice or any other matter associated with estate administration, the importance of that cannot be emphasized enough. No, that's for sure. Um, any uh, advice which we're not doing it every day. Uh, we're not creating wills every day. We're not uh, doing uh, those disbursement of uh, properties like an after a person's passed away. Exactly. Uh, so we do need the professional advice. So true. And even in my practice, I learn something new every day. So. Oh, for sure. It, it, in our profession, it's like that. Like in a real estate, like in no uh, single deal is the same as the previous one. So it's always changing. Well, um, when you're talking about probate, probate, like a lot of people probably don't even know what the probate means is. So can you explain what probate is and why it's necessary in Ontario? So simply speaking, probate is the starting point of estate administration. Mm -hmm. It's the start of the process when there is a death, somebody has died, and you need to deal with winding up their affairs and drawing things to a conclusion. Right. Step one is getting probate, which is a legal process, and it is the court certifying the authority of one individual or certain individuals as the proper representative of the deceased person. Mm -hmm. So it's a certificate that's issued by the court naming a certain person as the estate trustee. It can be with or without a will, depending on what's happened. Oh, nice. Like, you know, it's a pretty good description about that. Um, I, I couldn't do that. Um, but uh, no, thank you uh, for making uh, this pretty simple for people to understand. Uh, moving on to my next question. Uh, what are the first steps an executor should take when they find out they need to go through the probate process? Um, so I know the executor, a lot of people probably don't know when you assign someone um, in your will, that they're going to take care of your state matters or not only the state, but also the will, I guess, correct? Well, step one, find out if there is a will. Ah. 
And if there is a will, find out if that is the last will the person who died had signed off on. Mm. If there are any subsequent wills, then try to find out where those are. And in the process, eliminate whether there is a will or if there isn't one. Mm. Because the forms that you need to fill out when you submit an application to the court, they can differ if there is a will or there isn't one. Mm. The questions that would be asked when completing the application would be different. Mm. So you have to address them accordingly. Oh, nice. Well, that's good. Like, you know, our week is going pretty fast today, and I want to do that because I'm getting a lot of uh, people saying that, try to keep it great information, but try to keep it like you know, around 20 minutes or yep. 30 minutes. And uh, you seem like they're all prepared today. <laughs> Uh, so that's good. Uh, well, are there any assets that do not require probate in Ontario? Could you provide some examples? The most common examples would be designated assets. Mm -hmm. If you have something like registered investments like RSBs or TFSAs, which have the ability to designate beneficiaries, right? those would bypass probate. Mm. If there is, um, say, something like life insurance policies with designated beneficiaries, those would bypass probate. Mm. And um, certain kinds of jointly owned assets could pass bypass probate as well. Right. And just in case, like for husband and wife, you know what I mean to say? Not, not all the time. Um, it has to be clear what the intention in creating those joint assets is. Okay, okay. Sometimes you may see assets are jointly owned between, well, spouses, yes. Yes. Or between a parent and an adult child. Right, right. Those kind of joint owned, jointly owned assets could be questioned as mm. whether or not they were truly intended as joint ownership or is it a matter of convenience in which case should that asset really belong to the estate? Yeah. So the intention and the nature of the asset has to be carefully looked at. Oh, well, it, that's a right near question because recently what happened, um, one of uh, my clients reached out to me. They had their joint property with uh, his partner. Um, they were not related. And uh, his partner passed away. And now he has a property uh, which he wants to lease out. Um, so my question for him was, who was the name on the property? And under it was under the corporation or something. And uh, so I wasn't sure that time because that was the first time that case came out in front of me. Uh, what would you have suggested in that case? Well, a starting point would be looking at any underlying documents or agreements that would set out the intention. Now, these are clearly not related parties, so... Mm -hmm. How is their relationship defined? Is right. it a business entity like a corporation or a partnership that defines that relationship? Mm. Or is there some kind of a trust arrangement, a, a bare trust arrangement that, mm. that identifies the property as being owned jointly, but there is an underlying purpose behind that? And if there is one, how should the ownership be dealt with mm. if there is a death or a breakdown in that relationship? Mm. So... It's like peeling the layers of an onion. No, for sure. And that's why, like, I you know it's a very uh, tricky one because uh, his partner started paying mortgage on it. Right. Because that's due. But finding out this process takes time. So he wants to lease it out as soon as possible so he can recover some of the mortgage money. Right. Um, but as a realtor, what, what your advice would be uh, to me? I think it's important to first identify the owners on title. Right. And then if there is an estate trustee that is the representative of the deceased owner required, one needs to be appointed. Mm. Sooner the better. Right. Because, again, the application processing times would depend on which court it has to be filed in, and some courts are busier than the others. Mm. And that will definitely impact on how soon things can get done. Right, right. So without those paperwork, like, I definitely have no way of doing it, like, you know, even putting out for the lease. Well, uh, yes, or MLS. because any third party right. who's not familiar with this um, arrangement mm -hmm. would want assurance of some kind that they are dealing with the proper representatives. Correct. Because if there is a loss, 
because of their dealing with this owner or representative, right? then who would they hold responsible or try to recover the loss from? That's right. That's right. So it's a liability issue for any third party dealing hmm. with such assets. For sure. And, and that was my answer to this gentleman as well. Um, that definitely I don't know your partner, first of all. And I don't know what his arrangements were with you um, and who paid the down payment, who didn't. Right. I can see your name on the, you know, APS, but it was like a brand new property. They was getting the position on that. Right. right? So it was like, you no, know, you cannot go on the geo warehouse and look into the public records whose name on it. It's just like an APS in front of me. Um, and that's also, I th actually it was not closed. It was like more like the assignment. Right. Um, so he wants to lease out because he got the, uh, before the closing, they can, uh, the position they can get and exactly. he can lease it out. But that was like a very typical, like, I don't have expertise on this. I rather recommend somebody who have dealt with it. Yep. Uh, you uh, refer, I can refer to that person. Uh, best person will be like, I'm not going to the lawyer, like a real estate lawyer. And they can probably figure out more uh, who to assign and how to proceed with this. Consulting real estate lawyers would be a good idea because they understand what's involved. They understand the nuances in there. Right. But to the extent you need expertise on dealing with the estate side of things, mm -hmm. you should look at somebody who has that that experience. Experience there. as well. And dealing with real estate is always tricky. Mm -hmm. Because um, there are huge liability issues if right. things go sideways. Right. So it in a situation like this, proceed with caution is obviously the first piece of advice. But right. Consult different advisors. Oh, sure. for sure. Yeah, those pro uh, professionals you have to get advice. Um, so tell me, how does this probate process differ when there's a will versus when there isn't one? Right. So when you're looking at um, getting a certificate of appointment of a state trustee that's the proper legal term for probate mm -hmm. so when you're looking to get the certificate and on, on the strength of a will mm -hmm. it's a little easier because you identify quickly who the applicant should be who should be the a person appointed right and it comes with a clear set of instructions. The will is your roadmap mm. for the deceased person's instructions. Right. So you have a clear set of instructions what the estate trustee should do and how to distribute their assets. Mm. So in that sense, it makes it a little easier. Right. So when you apply to the court for a certificate of appointment, you submit the original death certificate, the original will, with proof of execution that it was properly signed off on mm -hmm. where by the person who made the will and by two witnesses in support. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much information you have at the time, you can either pay the fee, the court fee, it's called a state administration tax. Mm -hmm. You either pay it based on the known value of the estate assets at that time or if there are too many unknowns, you can ask the court for permission to pay it later. Hmm. So it's relatively simpler. But if you're dealing with a situation where there is no will, hmm. then you have to look at the persons uh, related to the deceased who could have the first right to apply. Hmm. A priority over other people to be appointed as a state trustee. Hmm. It could be a surviving spouse. It could be adult children. It could be the siblings of the deceased or the parents of the deceased person, there there is a whole um, pecking order, mm. so to say, that's defined in, in statute and regulations. Nice, nice. So you have to identify those people. You have to get the others with an equal right to consent to this person's appointment and right. renounce their right. Yeah. And then you have to go around this whole um, exercise trying to figure out what would be the fair market value of those assets on the day this person died mm. and figure out how to pay the estate administration tax, whether you need to provide any affidavits in support explaining why you cannot pay that amount up front or if you need time to find out what assets and liabilities were. Right. So it's a little more involved, a little more complicated. Mm. 
because there are more unknowns in this picture than the first. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, that's why it's important to have your will, right? Absolutely. Uh, and also, not only have the will, uh, if you're buying more properties, for example, or you're creating more assets, uh, you have to update those wills on a regular basis as well. A lot of times it happens, I have seen it uh, dealing with different clients. They had done their will, but they haven't updated from last four or five years. And during that four or five years, things have changed. They got like a more property, they dispose of like a few properties. And uh, it, it's just like accounting, like keeping in all the records, uh, what's going to happen, what you accumulated and how it should be distributed, right? I'm glad you said that, Vish, yeah. because Record keeping is one of the most important things in the life of an executor. Hmm. Your records as the estate trustee have to be unimpeachable. Because at the end of the day, when you are finished winding up the estate, you are answerable to the beneficiaries. Hmm. And if they're not satisfied with the way the administration has been conducted, or if there are issues that they're trying to raise, then they could go to court ask for directions or compel a more thorough investigation and scrutiny of the accounts. Yep. So impeccable record keeping, that is the foremost priority for a person who's an estate trustee. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like, you know, I'm, and uh, we have like, you know, whenever we having this conversation, I have like one example uh, comes out always, uh, <clears throat> one or the other, like in, depending upon what we're talking about, and in this case happened, like, you know, a person got deceased. Uh, mom knew, like, you know, they have bought some land, but she has no paperwork. Where is that land is? Whose name on it? Have no idea. And it was like acres of land uh, this person had purchased. People knew that, like, in the purchase, but family didn't know where he purchased it and how he purchased it. So they have to go through all the stuff, like, you know, the bank statements or definitely he paid from somewhere i think like a backtracking and everything and it was such a hassle it can be a hassle and yeah. then you would probably end up enlisting a real estate adv a lawyer's advice to track down the ownership and search the land registry records and and try to get those answers and right. it's time consuming and it's it's stressful oh for sure for sure and that's why like i you know you um end up paying more, which is... That too is true. Right? Uh, because somebody has to do the work, right? Yeah. And uh, when they're doing work, like um, they, uh, they need to get paid. Um, so we're talking about like the, some challenges like this come up, but what are the other common challenges do executors face during the probate process and how can they overcome them? Well... Common challenges faced by executors would be um, locating or identifying all the assets and liabilities of the deceased person. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, like you, like you just pointed out, people tend to put things away. Yes, there might be share certificates from decades ago, which may still have some value, but you don't discover them after much longer, or they lapsed just recently, and you couldn't have done anything about it right it's it's things like that which is why um it's important when you're in the process of planning your estate it's important to keep a running list and inventory of all your assets mm. so basically do your estate trustee a favor and show them where to look for the assets right. now identifying liabilities could be a little bit easier because you can advertise for creditors. Oh, for sure. An estate trustee does have the obligation to make that kind of um, an advertisement to, to call for reasonable creditors and, and identify if they are legitimate or not. Hmm. And obviously the legitimate ones have to be paid out. Exactly. So, there is a more defined structure for mm. identifying creditors and dealing with them. Right. But where would you start to look for the assets? Exactly. It could be something as simple as um, running a land registry search. To go back to your example, if you know that, or if you think you know that the deceased person owns some real estate somewhere, right. but didn't know where, 
it could be done at least here in Ontario through a search in the land registry. Mm. Similarly, you could run searches in um, other government agencies right. and, and try and locate other assets like shares and corporations mm. and stuff like that. But beyond that, it is a lot of routine searching down, down at the very grassroots levels, going through their personal effects, looking through their paperwork, and then, well... You could try and read through their previous year's tax returns mm. and see what income sources you could identify and then try to trace them from there. Yeah. Well, most of the time, I, I believe, like most of the people doing the accounting, um, getting done by accountants, so you can get some records from them as well. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, some people do, I know, like, you know, uh, previous generation, they used to do a lot, like they're doing by their own. Yeah. Um, and uh, they they tend to miss like those information, which can be passed. And on top of that, like a lot of time, we don't even assign. It's very common that people don't assign the executors, uh, or people don't assign like and who's going to take care of their will, right? Is that very common? No, it's not because um, to have a valid will, hmm. one of the important components is to identify an executor, executor, which is why it's important to have um, a will and part of attorney documents prepared professionally. Right. Because um, there are things that can get missed. Hmm. And I've said this before, there is no one size fits all approach to right. estate planning. So there are some statutory requirements that need to be met. Hmm. And obviously you identify the executor or the estate trustee right away. Mm. What sometimes people don't think about is having a fallback to that plan. Mm. You name a person as your estate trustee, right. but what if that person becomes ill or incapacitated or even dies before the will maker? Yeah. Then there is no fallback. Uh, what they, what, like whatever reason, they like, say like, I don't have to do anything. I don't want to deal with this anymore. There's too much work. I don't want to deal with them. And I don't want to, you know, all the, uh, uh, siblings who are fighting for the property or asset. Right. I don't want to deal with them. And executor doesn't want to do it. So it is possible that a person who's named in the will as a state trustee doesn't want to take on that obligation. Right. They are absolutely at liberty to decline the appointment. Hmm. So the easiest way to do that would be to resign in writing before the estate administration has even started. Hmm. Because if you start doing some of the work and then decide that you want to back off, right. you will require a court order to um, allow you to resign. Uh -huh. And part of that would also include preparing your accounts to date from the day you started acting as a state trustee to the day you stopped. Mm. So that's more involved, more cumbersome, and obviously expensive. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, we have enough challenges, I think, uh, for the executors as well. or somebody like, you know, walk away. Uh, how long usually it does take to, pro um, does the probate process typically take in Ontario and what factors can affect this timeline? It depends on which court that you file in. Hmm. Probate applications are filed in the local area where the deceased person last lived hmm. at the time of death or where they owned real estate okay. in Ontario. Okay. So within Ontario, Toronto is by far the busiest court in the province, mm. but Toronto also has a dedicated estates branch. Mm. So there is the capacity and the ability to process things faster. Mm. But again, being the busiest courts, it there can be delays which cannot be explained. And typically it can take a minimum of six to eight weeks to process. Hmm. Other places in Ontario where they're not as overburdened, right. they can be a lot less. Hmm. In fact, in Milton, I ha I've i had consistently good turnaround times and the fastest was a week hmm. from when I applied. Oh, nice. Which I think was a stroke of pure luck, but <laughs> it just goes to say that- It was before COVID or after COVID? No. Last year. Oh, yeah. So 2023. after 2023. Oh, okay. So things really depend on a lot of uh, factors in the court system. Right. The availability of judges to review them, the availability of staff, mm. um, 
resources get redirected if there are trial sittings right. coming up or or a series of motion hearings being scheduled. So all of that can impact the resource allocation within the courthouse. Mm. And that can impact on times. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, it's uh, these days, like in the staffing issues is the other thing, depending upon the uh, what's going on. That's um, true. So those timelines can, can change. And that's all depends upon like what you mentioned before. It's when you don't have a, uh, paper record or any record uh, which you have to find out about like the assets and everything and then can definitely increase the timeline. It can. Yeah. Well, um, we were talking about this one. We're not including that, right? Could you discuss the state administration tax and how it's calculated in Ontario? Sure. A state yeah. administration tax, it's commonly understood or known as probate fee. Hmm. It's a provincial tax separate and apart from the federal income tax and related um, items. Hmm. This is a fee that's paid to the province of Ontario based on the date of death value of the assets hmm. subject to probate. Hmm. In Ontario, um, after the first $50,000 worth of assets, a state administration tax is calculated as 1.5%. Hmm. So, and that is payable at the time of making an application for probate. This government, like, take everywhere, like, you know, from, even the person is dead, like, you know, still they have to pay tax. Well, <laughs> debt and taxes, they're the only two certainties of life. Oh my God, can't believe that. And so, so, so many things like we don't consider um, when these kind of situation happen. Right. And I pr honestly speaking, I haven't thought about that before, that even on that, you have to pay the tax. Right. So when people engage in tax planning measures, yes. one consideration among income tax planning strategies should also include probate planning strategies. Because mm. at, at the end of the day, when somebody dies, it becomes the estate trustee's responsibility to arrange for payment of these costs and fees right. from the estate assets. Mm. And if there is no liquidity in the estate at the immediate time, then you don't want to be in a scramble to arrange for those things. Mm. Well, I know every time I sigh, whenever I hear the tax, uh, but hey, this is what it is, like, you know, and you all have to deal with it. So looking into the Ontario, how has the probate process in Ontario changed in a recent year, if at all? Well, a couple of years ago, there were significant changes to um, the estate and probate laws in Ontario. Mm. Um, the biggest change, in my view, that's helped a lot of people is the introduction of something called a small estate certificate. Mm. It is um, it is a probate certificate, so to speak, but for modest estates, the cap being $150,000 worth of probatable assets. Mm. Um, these are relatively simpler to complete and they tend to be processed a little bit faster. Mm. So even though you need probate or a certificate of appointment to handle and administer estates, it's a little less cumbersome to finish and complete a small estate certificate application. Um, some of the bigger ones, you may have heard this before, Vish, but before, um, until the changes kicked in, marriage would automatically revoke an existing will. Mm. That is no longer the case. Mm. If there is an existing will and a subsequent marriage occurs, the previous spouse is treated as if they predeceased the will maker. Another big change is um, in the case of an intestacy. Can you explain a little bit more uh, what you just said? Mm -hmm. The intestacy? No, before that. Um, the the marriage, marriage, revoking a will. Yeah. So previously, um, like I said, if there is an existing will and a subsequent marriage, right. the will is treated as null and void. Hmm. So if this person who subsequently married died right the existing will would not count and it would be treated as if he died he or she died intestate without a will mm. so the rules around um 
somebody dying without a will would trigger. Right. And you would have to deal with it in that sense. Hmm. But now, the existing will of a person who subsequently married does not automatically revoke it. It hmm. does not cancel it. Hmm. Instead, a, a divorced spouse named in that will would be treated as if they had predeceased or died before the will maker. Oh, so okay. they would have no entitlement whatsoever. Okay, okay. That's one. Right. Um, when somebody dies without a will and leaves a spouse surviving them, right. under the laws of intestacy, the surviving spouse is entitled to a preferential share. Hmm. In Before the new rules kicked in, it would mean that the first $200,000 of the estate right. would be the preferential share of the surviving spouse. Right. That has now changed. It has gone from 200000 to 350000 Right, right. That's, that's a big relief for a surviving spouse. Yes. And it is um, an effort to curb some of the support claim litigation in, in cases where somebody died without a will and there is a spouse needing support from the estate. Well, these are some great, great information. Um, I know, like, you know, uh, we might want to keep it like in that 20 minutes over here. We will continue asking questions. Uh, but just for the viewer purpose, because of your request, uh, we might come with the second episode of this one. Uh, if this one is finished within 20 minutes uh, or less than half an hour, we'll keep in one episode. So uh, keep watching. If uh, this episode is not finished over here, you're going to get the part two. All right. And this podcast is for informational purpose only and should not be considered as financial or investment advice. Consult with your professional before making any real estate decisions.